Hello and welcome back. You've been listening to a dramatic reading of Into the Wild by the great John Krakauer. A reminder to always please support the author. Make sure you get a copy of the book, the audiobook, whatever, and support the uh, the publisher as well. We're picking up on Chapter 13, Virginia Beach. And I know there's some of you here who are listening to this or watching this for school and things like that. You've been eager for us to pick the story back up, so we're doing it. Okay, bonus session coming your way here. Chapter 13, Virginia Beach. Let's go. Opening quote. The physical domain of the country had its counterpart in me. The trails I made led outward into the hills and swamps, but they led inward also. And from the study of things underfoot, and from reading and thinking, came a kind of exploration, myself and the land. And in time, the two became one in my mind. With the gathering force of an essential thing realizing itself out of early ground, I faced in myself a passionate and tenacious longing to put away thought forever and all the trouble it brings, all but the nearest desire, direct and searching, to take the trail and not look back, whether on foot or snowshoes or by sled, into the summer hills and their late freezing shadows. A high blaze, a runner track in the snow would show where I had gone. Let the rest of mankind find me if it could. That was John Haynes, The Stars, The Snow, The Fire, 25 Years in the Northern Wilderness. Two framed photographs occupy the mantle in Corinne McCandless's Virginia Beach home. One is Chris as a junior in high school, and the other of, in the other of Chris as a seven-year-old, in a pint-sized suit and crooked tie, standing beside Corinne, who is wearing a frilly dress and a new Easter hat. What's amazing, says Corinne, as she studies the images of her brother, is that even though the pictures were taken ten years apart, his expression is identical. She's right. In both photos, Chris stares at the lens with the same pensive, recalcitrant squint, as if he'd been interrupted in the middle of an important thought and was annoyed to be wasting his time in front of the camera. His expression is most striking in the Easter photo because it contrasts so strongly with the exuberant grin Corinne wears in the same frame. That's Chris, she says with an affectionate smile, brushing her fingertips across the surface of an image. He'd get that look a lot. Lying on the floor at Corinne's feet is Buckley, the Shetland sheepdog Chris had been so attached to. Now 13 years old, he'd gone white in the muzzle and hobbles around with an arthritic limp. When Max, Corinne's 18-month-old Rottweiler, intrudes on Buckley's turf, however, the ailing little dog thinks nothing of confronting the much bigger animal with a loud bark and a flurry of well-placed nips, sending the 130-pound beast scurrying for safety. Chris was crazy about Buck, Corinne says. That summer he disappeared. He wanted to take Buck with him after he graduated from Emory. He asked Mom and Dad if he could come by and get Buck, but they said no because Buckley had been just hit by a car and was still recovering. Now, of course, they second-guessed the decision. Even though Buck was really badly hurt, the vet said he'd never walk again after the accident. My parents can't help wondering, and I admit that I can't either, how things might have turned out different if Chris, Chris had taken Buck with him. Chris didn't think twice about risking his own life, but he never would have put Buckley in any kind of danger. There's no way he would have taken the same kinds of chances if Buck had been with him. Standing five feet eight inches tall, Corinne McCandless is the same height as her brother was, maybe an inch taller, and looks enough like him that people frequently asked if they were twins. An animated talker, she flips her waist-length waist hair from her face with a toss of her head as she speaks and chops the air for emphasis with small, expressive hands. She is barefoot. A gold crucifix dangles from her neck. Her neatly pressed jeans have creases down the front. Well, thanks, John. You know, the author just going into some of this, like, detail and putting us there. It's a, it's a documentary, but we're also, he's kind of like painting pictures with us as well as laying down facts. Like Chris, Corinne is energetic and self-assured, a high achiever, quick to state an opinion. Also like Chris, she clashed fiercely with Walt and Billy as an adolescent. 
but the differences between the siblings were greater than their similarities. Corinne made peace with her parents shortly after Chris disappeared, and now, at the age of 22, she calls their relationship extremely good. She's much more gregarious than Chris was and can't imagine going off into the wilderness or virtually anywhere else alone. I think like most of us would, right? That's not unusual, um, at least in the majority, right? And although she shares Chris's sense of outrage over racial injustice, Corinne has no objection, moral or otherwise, to wealth. She recently bought an expensive new home and regularly logs 14-hour days at CAR Services Incorporated, the auto repair business she owns with her husband, Chris Fish, in the hope of making her first million at an early age. I was always getting on mom and dad's case because they worked all the time and were never around, she reflects with a self-mocking laugh. And now look at me. I'm doing the same thing. Chris, she confesses, used to poke fun at her capitalist zeal by calling her the Duchess of York, Ivana Trump McCandless, and a rising successor to Leona Helmsley. Her criticism of his, his criticism of his sister never went beyond good-natured ribbing, however. Chris and Corinne were uncommonly close. In a letter delineating his quarrels with Walt and Billy, Chris once wrote to her, Anyway... I'd like to talk to you about this because you're the only person in the world who could possibly understand what I'm saying. Ten months after Chris's death, Corinne still grieves deeply for her brother. I can't, get, I can't seem to get through a day without crying, she says with a look of puzzlement. For some reason, the worst is when I'm in the car by myself. Not once have I been able to make the 20-minute drive from home to the shop without thinking about Chris and breaking down. I get over it, but when it happens, it's hard. On the evening of September 17th, 1992, Corinne was outside giving her Rottweiler a bath when Chris Fish pulled into the driveway. She was surprised he was home so early. Usually, Fish worked late into the night at CAR services. He was acting funny, Corinne recalls. There was a terrible look on his face. He went inside, came back out, and started helping me wash Max. I knew something was wrong with him, because Fish never washes the dog. I need to talk to you, Fish said. Corinne followed him into the house, rinsed Max's collar in the kitchen sink, and went into the living room. Fish was sitting on the couch in the dark, with his head down. He looked totally hurt. Trying to joke him out of his mood, I said, What's wrong with you? I figured his buddies must have been razzing him at work maybe telling him they'd seen me out with some another guy or something. I laughed and asked, have the guys been giving you a hard time? But he didn't laugh back. When he looked up at me, I saw that his eyes were red. It's your brother, Fish said. They found him. He's dead. Sam, Walt's oldest child, had called Fish at work and given him the news. Corinne's eyes blurred and she felt the onset of tunnel vision. And voluntarily, she started shaking her head back and forth, back and forth. No, she corrected him. Chris isn't dead. Then she began to scream. Her keening was so loud and continuous that Fish worried the neighbors were going to think she was, he was harming her and call the police. Corinne curled up on the couch in a fetal position, wailing without pause. When Fish tried to comfort her, she pushed him away and shrieked at him to leave her alone. She remained hysterical for the next five hours. But by 11 o'clock, she had calmed herself sufficiently to throw some clothes into a bag, get into the car with Fish, and let him drive her to Walt and Billy's house in Chesapeake Bay, a four-hour trip north. Woo, emotional recount there. On their way out of Virginia Beach, Corinne asked Fish to stop at their church. I went in and sat at the altar for an hour or so while Fish stayed in the car, Corinne remembers. I wanted some answers from God, but I didn't get any. Earlier in the evening, Sam had confirmed that the photograph of the unknown hiker faxed down from Alaska was indeed Chris, but the coroner in Fairbanks required Chris's dental records to make a conclusive identification. It took more than a day to compare the x-rays, and Billy refused to look at the faxed photo until the dental ID had been completed, and there was no longer any doubt whatsoever 
that the starved boy found in the bus beside the, the Shoshana River was her son. The next day, Corinne and Sam flew to Fairbanks to bring home Chris's remains. At the coroner's office, they were given the handful of possessions recovered from the body. Chris's rifle, a pair of binoculars, the fishing rod Ronald Franz had given him, one of the Swiss Army knives Jan Burris had given him, the book of plant lore in which his journal was written, a Minolta camera, Minolta camera excuse me, and five rolls of film. Not much else. The coroner passed some papers across her desk. Sam signed them and passed them back. Less than 24 hours after landing in Fairbanks, Corinne and Sam flew on to Anchorage, where Chris's body had been cremated following the autopsy at the Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory. The mortuary delivered Chris's ashes to their hotel in a plastic box. I was surprised how big the box was, Corinne says. His name was printed wrong. The label said Christopher R. McCandless. His middle initial is really J. It ticked me off they didn't get it right. I was mad. Then I thought, Chris wouldn't care. He'd think it was funny. They caught a plane for Maryland the next morning. Corinne carried her brother's ashes in her knapsack. During the flight home, Corinne ate every scrap of food the cabin attendant set in front of her. Even though, she says, it was that horrible stuff they serve on airplanes, I just couldn't bear the thought of throwing away food since Chris had starved to death. Over the weeks that followed, however, she found her appetite had vanished, she had, and she lost 10 pounds, leading her friends to worry that she was becoming anorexic. Anorectic, it says. I don't know if it's the same or just a pronunciation. Back in Chesapeake Beach, Billy had stopped eating too. A tiny 48-year-old woman with girlish features. 48 years old and you lose your son. My goodness. She lost 48 pounds before her appetite finally returned. Walt reacted the other way, eating compulsively and gained 8 pounds. A month later, Billy sits at her dining room table, sifting through the pictorial record of Chris's final days is all she can do to force herself to examine the fuzzy snapshots. As she studies the pictures, she breaks down from time to time, weeping as only a mother who has outlived a child can weep, betraying a sense of loss so huge and irreparable that the mind balks at taking its measure. Such bereavement, witnessed at close range, makes even the most eloquent apologia for the high-risk activities ring fatuous and hollow. I just don't understand why he had to take those kinds of ch chances, Billy protests through her tears. I just don't understand it at all. Wow, that's the end of that chapter. Super emotional. I didn't even think there was more to kind of get into from that angle of Chris's family. I thought, all right, we're good. We kind of know where they're coming from and that motivation. But but John Krakauer takes us into the after part of his parting. He's just so good. I mean, we still have this much of the book and he hasn't really like died yet in the in the forward narrative. Right. So once again, I know it's difficult material, but just masterful storytelling in terms of his choosing where to position the information and where to put the focus on the story. And he's make and he can make something that I think is also kind of hard for all of us to feel totally attached to. It's a difficult story in the first place. A lot of details and stuff like that. Sometimes people said it's kind of dry, hard to get through, but can't you just give it up for John Krakauer and his way to get that information out in a really dramatic, interesting way? It's like almost part of the drama, the, the scenery is his reveal of the information and how cleverly um, he's, he's sewn it together and takes us forward, backward through different people's perspectives, because we all have those unique perspectives on our own situations and stuff, right? Hey, so thanks for sticking with me. I'll get another session into you. Got to head down and do dad stuff, but appreciate everybody uh, supporting and encouraging my little hobby here. And I'm glad that it helps you get along in class and something academic. I think that's something redeeming uh, from the retelling of the story. All right. So stay tuned. We'll see you on the next one.